Hi everybody. In this video, I'm going to talk about the two broad types of transport that cells use to move molecules across their membrane. And to understand these transport types, you have to understand that this is essentially an extension of the previous video, which involved gradients. So for passive transport, which requires no energy and moves molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration, there are two broad types. There is simple diffusion, and there is also going to be facilitated. Now, the difference being whether or not transport proteins are required. And for facilitated diffusion, you need transport proteins. And the transport proteins are shown in purple, the light purple and the dark purple. Now, for simple, for simple passive transport, this is gonna involve things like water and other things that are dissolvable in fats. The membrane, of course, being made of phospholipids. So things that can just pass right through by dissolving through the membrane include things such as steroid hormones, other fatty acids, and oxygen and carbon dioxide. So here, I drew something that was fast soluble as being in brown, and sure enough, what you would end up seeing would be these fat soluble molecules would diffuse right down their gradient to where there are fewer fat molecules, right through the membrane. Now, for facilitated diffusion, facilitated diffusion involves things that cannot just freely dissolve through the membrane. They are either charged and or they are water soluble, and sometimes they're just too large such as glucose here. So I've got sodium shown in red, potassium shown in green, and I've got glucose shown in blue. Now for ions such as sodium and potassium, in order for them to move down their gradient, there needs to be a channel protein. A channel protein, you can think of it as being a sewer, where when it's open, things can freely just flow right through and get to the other side where there's less of it. So for example, I have this channel protein, and when activated, it's going to open up a channel. And this will allow a single type of ion, whatever ion it is specific to, to flow down its gradient into the air where there's less of it. So in this case, sodium would flow in. Now for potassium, for a channel protein, potassium would indeed flow outwards where there's less potassium. Now, for things that are too large to pass through channel proteins, you need carrier proteins. And carrier proteins are a little bit different because it's not really just a hole. It involves a specific spot where that molecule would bind, connect, and be pushed through to the other side where there's less of it. So in this case, I've got glucose. And when the spot opens up, <clears throat> glucose, could indeed plug right into where glucose normally would go. And then that would flip the switch, change the shape of this carrier protein, which would then open it up on the other side and glucose would move inside the cell. And again, this is still going from high concentration to low concentration. They just need help getting through that fatty membrane. So all of these methods for passive transport require no ATP, and they're all going down their gradient, whether it is directly through the membrane or requiring some kind of facilitation through a transport protein. Now active transport is quite different. Active transport requires ATP, needs energy to move things against their gradient. So here you can think of it taking a big heavy rock and rolling it up the hill, and that takes your energy to do so. So for here, you've got two types. You have primary active transport, and then you're going to have secondary active transport. Now, they're named this because in order to get secondary active transport, you need to have primary active transport first. And primary active transport is important because it is used to create this strong electrochemical gradient. So what creates these strong gradients and uses ATP? The best example are going to be ATPase pumps. ATPase pumps 
such that sodium will be pumped out using ATP, and at the same time, potassium is pumped in. So here, you are creating a gradient such that you have the majority of the sodium on the outside of the cell, the majority of the potassium on the inside. So you're using ATP to create this strong gradient. And this gradient that you needed energy to create is then going to basically create the environment so that way you can move other molecules against their gradient. So in this case, I've got glucose shown in blue and I get amino acids shown in a turquoise. Now, in the yellow squares, these are going to be transport proteins. Now, transport proteins can be symporters, which would mean the two molecules move in the same direction, or they can be antiporters, meaning the molecules move opposite directions. So the first thing I'll show you are going to be symport proteins. Now here, for secondary active transport, remember that for you use primary active transport to create a gradient where there's a lot of sodium on the outside. So when activated, there's going to be a spot, and really two spots that open up in that transport protein. And what's gonna happen? You have a lot of sodium that you pumped out using ATP. That's going to go into that protein. But there's also a spot for glucose. And that's going to bind there also. And once both molecules are in this transport protein, it causes a change in shape such that the other side opens up and it acts almost as a catapult would or a switch such that now spots are open, sodium rushes down its gradient. And again, this is a gradient that you use ATP to create. And when ATP goes through, it brings glucose along with it against its gradient. So going from an area where there's low glucose to an area where there's even higher glucose. So this is symporter. This is a symporter because both sodium and glucose go in the same direction. Now let's use another example of potassium and amino acids. And for this, we'll focus on antiporters. And the idea is much the same as what we just kind of went through with sodium and glucose, except the molecules be moving in different directions. So again, you would have basically a spot that opens up on each end. You would have potassium binding to its spot. And you'd have the amino acids, in this case, binding to its spot. And once both binding spots are activated, it again changes the shape of it, acts like a catapult or switch. And what you end up with are the two molecules going in opposite directions, amino acids, will be moved inwards where there's already a lot of amino acids and potassium moves down its gradient. So there's an antiporter in which the two molecules, potassium and amino acids, move in opposite directions. So ultimately with active transport, what you can see here is that for primary active transport, you create this strong gradient by moving a bunch of ions onto one side using ATP and then you use that gradient that you just created using ATP, so that way you can move the ions back into the cell or out of the cell, and you bring along another molecule. In essence, it's kind of like a hitchhiker. So all in all, that's passive versus active transport, simple and facilitated passive transport, and primary and secondary active transport. Now, if you have more questions, come by office hours, and I will happily draw this stuff out in more detail, and I'll explain it in, in other ways to you. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions about these transport types, as these transport types are vital to understanding almost all the other body systems that we will go through in AMP1 and that you will go through in AMP2.